Welcome to True Law Stories. Ian Garlic here. And uh, today we are going to talk about an interesting case of identity, of name change. Uh, we have Julie Mayfield and Irene Pons. Julie and Irene are, are going to talk about Julie's struggle uh, to get her name change, get a hold of her identity. Um, and very interesting, uh, very critical. I think it's a critical rights situation, but understand the law and understand what can go wrong too if you don't have just even control of your name. But before we get started, this is brought to you by storycruise.com. If you're looking to tell the story of your business, go to storycruise.com slash true law to find the best ways to tell a story of business through video and through marketing. Um, all right, Julie and Irene, thank you so much for being on the show. Julie, um, real quick before we get into all of everything that's going on, um, what are you doing now? Where are you located? So I am currently in Nebraska, good old Midwest USA. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a lot of irons in the fire. I have a weekly podcast that I do, uh, justjulie.com uh, is where you can find that at. And then uh, just working on building my brand and advocating and educating about intersex, what it means to be an intersex person um, I'm XXY. So just all of that is currently what I am doing and also keeping my irons and fires. Um, got to do it. You got, you got to keep, you know, it's always, it's, it, you've got to keep moving, moving, moving. I understand that. And Irene, tell me a little bit about your, uh, let, let's get back into it. Your legal background, how you became attorney and what you're doing now. So, um, I've always wanted to be an attorney Harvard. But um, I became an attorney and immediately was always um, compassionate about others. I grew up on welfare with my mom raising us children um, from a divorced father. We grew up, I grew up in um, Houston, Texas, but I was born in Puerto Rico. So I'm an Espanol, I'm fluent in Spanish, which has been a huge benefit in my career. Um, and then graduated law school and got a job working at a, at a firm doing um, family law stuff. And um, from there started teaching uh, at the same time and then teaching became my full-time gig because I loved it so much. And what do you love about, you know, being an attorney now and teaching law? I love the fact that I can give back to others and that, um, you know, I'm empathetic and I have a compassionate heart and I always, I never wanted to be super wealthy um, as an attorney. And I know I never will be. My goal was always to be able to help others. And so I see that through the eyes of my students who are so excited about the opportunities to be able to make change in the world and um, their growth throughout the classes from the beginning of semester to the end, when they finally have those aha moments of, wow, this is something I really want to do. And this is, you know, what I can do to help others. And so um, that's what touches me on those levels and why I continue to do what I do. That's fantastic. And, you know, before we get in more into deeper in Julie's story, I just want to know, you know, what do you feel like when we hear a story like this, what are people's misconceptions about the law and the way the legal system works, especially for people that are un underprivileged or come from a less chance, you know, from a less of a background? I think to some, it feels like it's an unobtainable goal. And so me growing up on welfare and not having those opportunities and having to pay for everything, I want to show them that perseverance pays off and that anything that you want to do, you can do. Um, you know, I was fortunate in some regards because I can pass off as, as a white girl, so as, as they call me. And so um, it's a little bit different, right? And they're probably looking at me be like, you look like a green guy, like you have green eyes and this, you know, bleach blonde hair right now. And, and so how can we relate? But, you know, I'm here to tell them that they can, because in some ways or others, our stories are similar and they will be able to have the same opportunities that I did to, to be that voice. And if, and if they're not, like Julie said, you know, sometimes um, people are not always meant to be fighters, but that's why God gave me this voice and has paired me with Julie, who's an amazing person and human being to be able to be advocates for others who are less fortunate and don't have the voice themselves. Awesome. Awesome. I think it's awesome that in, uh, knowing her for as many years as I've known her and knowing her family because her whole family worked at Disney when we were at Disney and we talked earlier about being a part of a 384 family and we're all still in touch today and and her family was so much a part of that when I was at Disney too but uh when you think about the roles that she was able to play at Disney and you understand her heart it's almost like we are predestined 
right? That our lives are predestined because she's always been that person. And even, I think sometimes she talked about, I was laughing when she was talking about being perceived as a white girl, because I thought, boy, if they knew you used to be friends with Mary Poppins, like that would be funny. But when you think of that character and you think of the heart and the fight that was in that character, and that's very much a part of who she is even today, I think, I think our life does move in succession. And I think that the things we've gotten to do in our past are absolutely predicated on who we're gonna be sometimes in the future, so. Explain to everyone what intersex means and how it occurs and what it means to someone's life. Sure, absolutely. So intersex is, well, I guess let's just start from the beginning. Most people are aware that there are two genders, XX and XY. XX would be female, XY would be male. But in reality, there are 39 recognized chromosomal variants or variations that are on a spectrum between XX and XY. Those variations oftentimes mean that you weren't born with enough sex characteristics to be one gender or the other. You are often a conglomeration of both genders. Uh, that does not mean that you necessarily have both sex organs on the outside of your body. It has more to do with your genetic tissue and your chromosomal makeup. Um, but anything that's on that spectrum would be included now under the medical umbrella term of intersex. And roughly um, in the U.S., how many estimated intersex people are, are there out there? There's a lot of misinformation on the internet, as we all know, not everything out there is true. <laughs> but uh, they, they claim with XXY, they say it's one in 500. Uh, globally, they're saying 2%, so 153.4 million people are intersex. Most people in the United States, they can test during uh, utero in the 12th week to tell you if you're going to have a baby that will be born with a variation. If that proves true, usually they advise you to abort. So they'll say they're not going to have a viable life. Please try over, start again from the beginning. You know, the odds that your next kid will be intersex or slim to none. Uh, let's be honest, in reality, they're really not researching it. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the research is done in Australia, Japan, and the UK. America has been behind the ball for many many generations. And there's a great stat that I think people don't realize because they think, oh, who would tell them to abort and who would do it? In 2017, here in the United States, 65% of new parents that were advised they were going to have an intersex baby and to abort did. Wow. 65%, 80% in Belgium in 2018, so it's happening across the world, but it's very prevalent here in America that they'll say, that's not normal. They're not gonna be female and they're not gonna be male. So you should just cut your losses now and get rid of them. And that is a horrible injustice because there are so many of us that have gone on to live very pro productive lives. I'm an actress by trade and producer. I have friends that run banks and multi-billion dollar companies. So it really is not about that. It's oftentimes fitting that medical agenda of pushing two genders and only two genders. And here in America, that's deplorable. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, it's scary and sad. Uh, Julie, tell me a little bit about your story. So uh, I was born 47 XXY. That means I have an extra X chromosome attached to every single one of my chromosomal pairs. Uh, most dyadic or non-intersex people would have um, 46, right? So that's mm -hmm. why things like 23andMe is so popular because you can go back and find your chromosomal background and your lineage through things like that. But people like myself try and take those and it comes back inconclusive. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so 47, so for me what that means and it's different for everybody that's intersex and I didn't find out until much later in life. I found out at 17, I had the extra X chromosome while I was playing football in high school. And um, 
I was raised male because on the outside of my body, I presented male at birth, but in at puberty, I grew breast tissue. Uh, of course, you know, being the nineties and the eighties, they were just called moobs and you usually were accused of just being fat and lazy. So, uh, so we didn't think anything of it. Um, as a, my parents and I, we didn't think anything of it. We did find out we had the X, extra X, and that was attributed to that gynomastia is what they call it. But then they just put me on more testosterone and said, it's okay. He will even keel. It'll be great. He's not wow. going to have any issues, you know, bing, bang, boom. And that tends to be for XXY patients, the general consensus, just put them on more testosterone and that'll masculinize them out as they get older. Uh, at 43 though, I went and took part in a study at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland on XXY males. I went for a couple of reasons. I wanted to do my part for everybody coming after me uh, medically wise. And I had had a lot of medical issues through my thirties and forties. And so I went to kind of find out more about that. Also to kind of get a blueprint for the rest of my life and to provide NIH with whatever they needed for their study. At that study, I found out that not only did I have an extra X and I had the gynomastia, which I already knew about, but I also had a diminished Adam's apple. I had a female sized heart, male sized lungs. I was born with half a pancreas. I was born with half a uterus. And when I say half, a lot of people go half. It's just that XXY and so many intersex variations happen during the developmental stage of pregnancy. So for us intersex people, some of our organs may fully form and some of them may not. And it's sometimes a wash of what you may get in the in process. I was born with one ovary and one testicle. They were located wow. up where my ovaries would have been located. Uh, they were underdeveloped as well uh, at that same uh, protocol, I found out that I had precancerous cells in my female uterine floor that needed to be removed. I also had to have the ovary and testicle removed, so a hysterectomy in 2018. And then I found out that I had epilepsy. I'd been having night seizures since birth. I also, because of the XXY, I'd also now had lupus and osteoporosis of the lower back and spine. So wow. there's not a cure for that. Uh, and they said, look, your body does not respond well to extragenous testosterone. You had a prostate cancer scare in your 20s and you got off of it fully because doctors didn't know how to advise you on your XXY. But now your body needs a dominant hormone in order just to live longer. So uh, we'd like to put you on a crap load of estrogen. I mean, just an insane amount a week. I think I'm, I'm up around 52 milligrams a week of estrogen. I wear a patch, I take a pill, um, so much fun stuff. And then I said, that's gonna cause a full transition. And they said, yes, it will. It'll cause a full transition to your female end of your spectrum. But we feel like if you don't do this, you'll be dead by 48. Ugh. So, um, you know, a lot of people often ask, could you have just gone home and had the hysterectomy and, and not gone on estrogen? But the estrogen, they say, slows down the progression of the lupus and the osteoporosis in my body. So I could have, sure. And I had a great life as a male. I, you know, I was living my best life and doing film and television in LA and, and um, just doing great things. And um, I wasn't sure I really wanted to transition fully, knowing what that would mean. But with the support of my family and my parents and my friends and people like Irene, and the knowledge that it really is just a vessel, the soul and the driver are the same for me. And for everybody, I think this really is just a vessel. So with that knowledge and my strong faith, um, I said, sure, let's do it. And I told somebody the other day, had they have come to me and said, look, you have to drink this vial and it's gonna turn you into a chihuahua, but you'll have an extended life, I would be on your show today as a chihuahua. Like for me, it was more about just living longer and having a better quality of life and being able to go on and advocate for the intersex community at large and for XXYs like myself. Wow, that's a heck of a story. I'm sorry 
I mean, obviously you've, you've come out positive, but that's, that's a lot of health issues. A lot. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Any one of those two things. Toes. I lost two toes in the process. What? But hey, you get to wear cuter shoes. <laughs> that, I mean, at least you're finding the positive. That's amazing. Irene, when did you all first meet? How, how, when did Julie first come to you? Tell me a little bit about that. So I actually met her at Disney. We were both Disney characters at the Magic Kingdom. And um, so we have a long history to get together of doing parades and shows and, and dressing up. And um, we have always been main friends on Facebook. We have a big family. We call it Department 384. And we're all connected, even though we're miles apart from each other and unable to see each other. We just stay in each other's lives. And she had posted something about a name change. And so I private messaged her and I said, you know, I can help you with this. And Julie's like, well, I don't have any money. Like, I, I can't afford to hire your services and, you know, have you help me with this. And I was like, no, I'll, I'll do it for free. So um, that's how we kind of rekindled to be able to help her. And I said, do you mind if I use my UCF class and my students to help me do this as a project? And it'll, it'll be an experience for them to learn. And um, she was like, yeah, absolutely. This is great, an opportunity. And so with my class at UCF, we drafted a petition for a name change and we filed it with the court. And that's kind of where our story, you know, re, re began and our, our re emerged, re emerged with her getting her name changed. And I was absolutely on board because education and everything is key. You know, if we don't educate, we don't teach, then perceptions can't be changed, which is a whole part of my advocacy platform. And when she said that to me, my brother's an attorney in Tampa. Uh, I'm, I'm very familiar with law. And so I was like, yeah, let's do this. They need a practical case. Absolutely. I could use the help. So absolutely. I, I think my one prerequisite was I said, let's not turn this into a year long project. I was like, I got things to do, but, but it didn't, it didn't take that long at all. And that was kind of the beginning was the name change. And then we went right into, I feel like Within a few months, we went right into filing um, and looking into changing the gender aspects. Once I tried to initially go to Alabama and get the proper paperwork changed, but that led to some case law in Florida and some great things with their students. So it's just been a great union with UCF. And uh, so you, you started with a name change, right? And um, I, I, at what point, Julie, in your journey was this happening? So I had 2018 was the initial NIH protocol and things happened really fast after that. I want to say this was the summer of 2019. So it was really important for me because I started to audition again as Julie and mm -hmm. I needed my documentation to match, you know, I needed my I-9 to match and I needed to be able to go in and be like, I'm auditioning for the role of blah, blah, blah. And oh, by the way, my tax information still has my boy name on. <laughs> so um, I needed to change all that, but I just needed, even my genetic counselor at the time said, you need to pick a name pretty soon and people need to start calling you that. He's like, I know you don't care if people call you by your original name, which I don't. Um, a lot of people in the trans community will call it a dead name. Uh, it's not dead to me. He's still very much a part of me. I was born both. I have felt split my whole life. Uh, so Bradford's always been and continues to be a part of who I am. But I did, as I was going out into the world and trying to rebrand and recreate everything, I did need to go ahead and commit to Julie. So, um, and and the name process, you know, uh, was a long one too, because I was waiting. I'd, I'd given my parents permission to have a process or a say in the new process. So I was trying to wait for them to kind of come back with what they wanted to um, have me go by as well, which a lot of people go, what? You gave your parents naming process? And I said, well, you know, they named me initially and I ran with that name for 43 years. Had I been born in a full female body, they would have named me and I would still be using that name. So I said, it's hard on me to 
to have to go through something like this at 43, it must be monumentally hard for them to go through it as well. So if I can alleviate some of that stress for them in letting them have a say in my new name, then let's go ahead and do that. And uh, it was a really poignant story and a really, and, and that's how I ended up with Julie and the, and the spelling of my name, which is uh, really, and so. That's amazing. I mean, that, that's a tough decision to make. And you have so many other things going on and you throw something else in the mix. And I mean, that's, that's brave for sure. And, and, you know, I think name change is one of those things that everyone's kind of flexible on names these days. And we see, especially celebrities and actors kind of, you know, using their name, but we don't think of the legalities of it, do we? Especially when you're going around as a contractor. I mean, Irene, it's, it's a big deal to what your name is, isn't it, from a legal standpoint? <laughs> I mean, it means everything, you know, from getting paid, from tax, you know, tax consequences to being travel. able to travel. So that was really um, putting a huge dent in, in Julie's opportunities you know have a, a passport and travel and her name and not be looking at you and she's you know clearly female but they're like you know giving you the the, the third degree so just um being able to be treated like everyone else it's it's humane it's yeah i mean and not just humane it's i mean it, it's yeah treated like everyone else but just from a, a paperwork standpoint i mean that that's that's to me as hell <laughs> i can't imagine the the added stress of everything else on top of there. We um, have to change everything. I think too, it's important to remember that, especially when you think about law, which people don't think of the courts and all the court fees, but you know, I meet so many people now that are like, well, they get a divorce and they keep their name because it's cheaper to keep the name. Yeah, Then you is. go file all the court paperwork and the pay the $400 and you think just to get your original name back, it's $400. So yeah, I, the system's up. a little. Yeah, and it's and it, yeah, exactly. And then you know, you show up someplace with the wrong, you know, with a different look and different ID. And one thing, it's misspelled even. And Lord knows that it, it's you're done on your title of your car. Um, and so you know, you start to encounter some problems then, right? As you're trying to change your name. So um, I think not, so, well, Irene can correct me. I don't think the name change was necessarily hard. We went through that pretty easily. And I remember the judge at the name change walked up to me after hearing my story and, and said, you know, congratulations. And, you know, it was really sweet. I think he gave me a hug if I remember correctly. I don't remember actually, but anyway, um, really sweet. And that was just easy. Where the problem started was, after that, I went to go get documentation set up with my new name and um, like the social security, they have my new name, but I'm still listed as a male on my social. Uh, my driver's license in Florida uh, has my picture and my name, but the number is still male. I got pulled over when I moved to Nebraska a year, well, I got pulled over in March in Nebraska and the cop came up to the window and he was like, ma'am, can you get out of the car? And I thought, oh, he's gonna ask me on a date. And um, he totally said, your ID is not showing up in the system. And I said, what do you mean it's not showing up? It's a new ID, it's a valid ID. And he goes, it, it's oh, oh my not God. existent. And I said, okay, I need to tell you something and I need you to not freak out because I'm in the Midwest, run it as a male. And he ran it as a male and it popped up with my Julie picture and my Julie name. And he was like, I don't get it. And I'm like, it never got changed in Florida. So, oh. so I, you know, and then, but when I went to go get a license in Nebraska, they said, we need your birth certificate. And I was like, well, my birth certificate has my boy name on it. And they were like, well, we got to put what your birth certificate says. So that's where the issue started to come, not being able to get state agencies to really get on the same page and make sure that all the gender stuff was changed. So went to Alabama, asked Alabama, uh, had my name changed, was born both, here's some medical documentation, let's change it. And then I remember I called Irene and I was almost in tears and I was like, they're not gonna change it. They won't change it unless I prove that I went out and got a vagina, which I don't have to have because I was born both and I have the chromosomal and genetic variation 
tissue and everything else to prove that I was born both. So at that point in time, she said, well, let's figure it out. And I'll let her continue at this point with what we did next in Florida. So we filed in Florida because she was domiciled as a resident there. And for jurisdiction purposes, pursuant to Florida law, we needed to file there, even though she had an Alabama birth certificate. In Florida, it's not difficult to get a name change or a gender change. Um, and you don't have to prove that you had to have surgery. But under the guise of um, you know, ha having the law behind us, we looked at the, the, the supremacy clause and the full faith and credit clause and said, well, according to the full faith and credit clause, if we can get a court order from a court in Florida saying that you've got your denture, denture changed, we can then hypothetically take that over to Alabama, tell a judge in Alabama, we have a court order from Florida, you need to honor it pursuant to the constitution of the United States, and then they have to change her gender. But that didn't happen. What they still happened? want proof. What uh, happened? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, so I submitted, we had a certified copy of the judgment for her gender, which was done in Miami by another attorney um, affiliated in this group, Elizabeth Schwartz, who's just picked up the case pro bono as well and was helping Julie. And she was able to get that gender change done. When we submitted the certified copy of her gender change and her name change to the Alabama Vital Statistics Office, they sent us a letter saying that she's absolutely not going to be approved for it because she has to provide a letter from a doctor that says that she's undergone uh, surgery um, for her gender change. Wow. And it, so is now, how does that work? I mean, not the gender change. I get that, that, how that works. And if someone wants to figure that out, they can do some other searches. What I'm saying is, you know, now we've got this conflict, right, between two states and one state saying, no, this is how it is. Another state saying, this is how it is. What, you know, is it up to federal law? Where, how does, how does that get figured out? So that's going to be the next step. That. Yeah. So right now um, we are looking for an attorney in Alabama. We've spoken to one attorney and he's trying to find someone to help us take on this case for Julie Spite. Um, and that'll be crucial. The issue is that the county that she is from is a very conservative county and, um, if we file in that county, it will be rejected. And so ideally we do need to take it to the Supreme Court on a federal level to be able to fight this so that she has an opportunity to then have her, her gender change. Um, there is some recent precedent with another case that just came through um, and that particular judge did allow a gender change to occur without the necessity of having that, that letter. So. It's, it's a great time for Julie to be able to get this as an advocate for herself, um, but we just need to get the right team. And so that's, that's what we're doing now is trying to find that attorney that can help us. And, you know, when you're fine, quote unquote, looking for the right team, you know, what quality, what is the legal, what legal standard are you looking for? I mean, is this contract? Is this litigation? What is this? This is LGBTQ rights. It's constitutional. Um, so it would be a constitutional attorney or something that's an ally of the LGBTQ community, but it's, it's, it's activism, it's rights, human rights. Yeah. And, you know, and, and to that point, I think a lot of people think of the whole identifying aspect of it as simply as people wanting to switch back and forth and back and forth. And, um, you know, Julie, how do you feel like, you know, how, what are your feelings? I mean, obviously you feel you have the right to this, which, you know, I agree too. It's like, you're, it's genetics, but you know, how do you feel about, how do you go about changing people's minds about this? You know, I worked on Orlando's pride board uh, through 2020, through COVID. And, and it was one of the best experiences that I had. And I was able to really kind of reach into the proverbial cookie jar of so many different lifestyles and life and, and human aspect and stories. And we really are just all human. You know, mm -hmm. I even said it when I worked at Pride, I would love in 30 or 40 years to just have a parade and a huge festival each year where we all come together as people and say, oh my God, you didn't die last year. <laughs> Hooray. Yes. Um, that would be great, you know, just celebrating human life and quit breaking everything down. And, and that's not to say I don't support my own community, I do. I just, as a human, that would be great. 
some of the things I've learned is, you know, over in the UK, you're born and you get a number and it goes into a computer system and it's fairly easy to maneuver around that number whenever you need things throughout your life. Here in America, it all comes down to that piece of paper, a piece of paper that they charge you 28 bucks for to get a copy of when you lose it. But it's a piece of paper. And I think yeah. what a racket sometimes because I have to have that piece of paper to get a house loan. I need it to get credit. I need it to establish who I am. I need, you almost need it for every, your passport. And I'm like, a piece of paper. Yeah. And I guess where the importance lies is because of the ramifications of what that paper means or, or what you have to use it for in your life. I just, there's so many other people behind me or around me that don't have the strength that I have and don't have the resources I've been able to obtain. And it's probably a lot harder for them. They're certainly scared and it would be great not just for me, but if it get taken care of where people don't have this fear. You know, growing up, we used to all learn when you watch things like Sesame Street that you were supposed to know the people in your neighborhood and you were supposed to trust them on every level. And I think that is missing sorely in today's society. I think people are afraid to, to go and say, can you help me do this? Can you help me change this? I am struggling with getting what I need to be able to live a complete and quality filled life. And so for me, yes, it's about just getting my birth certificate changed. And people are like, oh, are you getting an X for intersex? And I'm like, no, I'm trying to fly under the radar. I don't need to get anything that says I'm not female because I, you know, my conspiracy theories in my head think they're gonna round us all up in a couple of years and say, get rid of them, ship them off to Cuba. And I just think, no, I just want my birth certificate to say female because that's what I am now in this form. I am female. But I would like to make it easier for everybody that comes after me. You know, one of my sister's favorite quotes is from Rumi, and I love it. And it says, make the world better than how you found it. And I feel like that's very important, you know, just to let's all make it better. So when we leave, it's easier for the people behind us. And some of the ways that we can do that is by just making things as easy as a name change or a gender change or correcting your paperwork to honor who you are. That's, that just seems really easy to me. And, and I, sometimes I struggle that there's a struggle. Yeah, it, it, it's sad, it's tough. And I, I, I empathize with you, but let's take the flip, you know, I, I was like, cause law, it's about two sides. Um, and so from a legal standpoint, Irene, is there any reason for someone like Julie not to be able to do this easily? Is there any reason at all? Like, are we missing something that's like, I mean, yes, legally, I'm, I'm not saying someone's more, someone else's morals, someone else's opinions about Julie's status, but legally, you know, are we protecting some, some other part of law? Are we protecting some, something else by doing this, by preventing? In Florida, um, there's no law in the books that would prevent anyone from being a gender change or being changed. Nothing for transsexual, for XXY. Um, so what we're running into is mindsets and politics, unfortunately. And the judge, the initial judge that we went um, in front of for her gender change in Orlando, um, actually in Kissimmee, denied it and he was up for re-election that year um, i don't know his political affiliation but i feel like that had a huge play in it um, i wrote a very strong memo of law which is public record based on um, the history in florida as it pertains to gender changes and um, there's no controlling authority which means there's no supreme court case that says you cannot do this when there weren't and any intersex courses there weren't any really intersex cases either in florida no right? no yeah there's been no precedent Yep, no precedent has been really set. And so there was no reason that he couldn't do it, which is why we kind of had to go down to Miami to another judge that was um, uh, more open and had already been granting these pretty liberally and go in front of them to be able to do it. And so, uh, yeah, and um, 
you know, where, you know, if, you, if it goes to the Supreme Court, where do you see this going? How, where, where do you see the battle going? Where do you see the, the, the bumps along the way? Um, I think the biggest is the education and recognition. The bumps along the way is trying to find somebody who's willing to take this case that isn't scared to fight all the way up and that understands the important implications of setting a precedent for the LGBTQ community and for anyone that's intersex like Julie. I think and the intersex, I mean, I think the LGBTQ is a huge part of it because we are the I in that acronym, but I think just for intersex people alone, even some that don't even recognize being a part of that community, it's just huge for intersex. Uh, I think what a lot of people don't know is I get a lot of pushback on TikTok and other platforms. They'll say, oh, it's rare. It's rare. And I'm like, really? It's not so rare. You know, it's 2% of the world's global population. So that means 153.4 million people currently are interested. Wow. And that's just the 2% that have survived unnecessary surgeries at birth and not being aborted because they tell you in the 12th week of gestation, if you find out that you're going to have a chromosomally variant kid, that you should abort it and try again. So that 2%, and people do, you know, people do. So that 2% is 2% of people that have made it. So if you really think about it, it's a lot more than 2%. But yes. they're operated on at birth. And sometimes they don't sur survive that operation or the complications, or they were operated on birth. And by the time they hit puberty, they feel really down about who they are as a person and they kill themselves. Or their parents are aborting them in utero because they're being told by the medical community, they're not gonna grow up and have a viable life. They're going to be child molesters or in jail by the time they're in their 20s. They're going to be dumb as a doornail. I mean, this is the realization of what it is to be intersex in this world at the moment. And we're still having to kind of recreate the wheel with trying to just educate people. So I think on a whole, this would be huge just to change perceptions. But also, there's going to be pushback because there's still people that follow that whole notion that they're just two genders, uh, that whole binary spectrum people don't believe in and there's a lot and when people are fearful that's when you see hate come out and that's mm -hmm. when you see um pushback so the law obviously you like you said in florida really it's it's open is there anything preventing on the federal level preventing julie from the official getting everything officially done no not on the federal level either there's there's no laws um about this in particular. So there's nothing to prevent her from doing this. It's just the old, the old constitution, you know, men and women get married and each state has, you know, um, just different rules and, and some states allow gay marriage and others don't. And so it's kind of a case by case basis. And Alabama is one of those, it's, you know, old Southern state, uh, more conservative values. And so we, we have to tackle it once, one state at a time. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's tough work. Um, and it's, it's tough to put yourself out there, Julie. And I, you know, and I very, very much respect you for doing this. Um, you know, getting out there legally too. what does, you know, legally, what, what does this do to you and the rest of your life? You know, because it must be disrupting the rest of your life. I mean, I would like to be able to get my passport. There are people that say, you know, I've even had people that come to me and say, well, we can get you your passport updated. That's easy. We can use this loophole or we can go and do this. And I'm like, I've already started this fight and the fight's more important for the intersex community than just taking a loophole option and getting my passport updated. But I would like to get some things taken care of and done. I'd like to be able to possibly get married in the future. And when I go to fill out my, what do they call it, application to get married, I'd like to be able to put down my female birth certificate. I would like to be able to travel and not have to worry that they're gonna find out that I was raised male, which, you know, me, I'm, I'm a smart ass and I'll turn around and I'll defend myself and put my warrior plates on, but I don't wanna have to deal with it. 
I want to fly under the radar. Um, it's just, I, I think what's funny too is, and Irene and I had talked about this, I don't know if she remembers, when I told my mom and dad that I was suing the state of Alabama, I was kind of like, uh, let, let's see what they say. And then I told my mom jokingly, I'm like, clearly the Mayfield women like to sue the state of Alabama because my mom and dad both used to be professors at Auburn University in the 70s and the 80s. And my mother was the catalyst in suing the university because female professors were not being given tenure. That's amazing. That's, I mean, that's a legacy right there. It's a legacy. So I said, look at us doing this. <laughs> Who knew? That, but I actually, but watching my mom, my mom and dad go through that uh, in adolescence and just what they had to go through with the state of Alabama themselves and with that university taught me so much about living your life with gratitude and grace and strength and that, um, you have to stand up for things like this. If you see an injustice, you absolutely have to fight and change it. Yeah, and but it's scary and it's tough. And then, it's so and, scary. And yeah, I mean, because you're you're battling a lot, and you know, and and as we've seen, you're battling some people that aren't afraid to do some bad things. Um, and so, putting yourself out there, you know because things have changed since when your mom sued, because now when you put yourself out there legally, it becomes news like this right here. You know, we're going to talk, we're going to put this out on the internet and it's going to stay out there forever. You know, how do you plan for that? How do you think about that? Or do you just go, I'm going to change this. I'm not, I'll worry about the rest of that when that, when, when we come to that. I'm human. So I think that, your brain absolutely goes there. I think you, I, and I've already had some instances just in other platforms where I've had to deal with some very personal stuff that um, has resulted in just people having access to me and people having access to my life. Um, you're gonna have haters in the world. Mm. One, of my, one of my favorite quotes is, you could be the sweetest peach in the barrel. I mean, you could absolutely be the sweetest, most delectable peach in the peach crate. But not everybody likes peaches. That's and a good you point. Have to, you know, you, it, for me, it's about quality of life and for making it better for the rest of my intersex community, wherever they fall on that spectrum. XX, X, XXY, XYY, um, Turner syndrome that, you know, the 39 recognized variations currently on a spectrum. And so just making it better for those 39 variations, I, you have to remember as somebody in public, you chose to be there and you chose to go out and fight the battles that you fight and to be ever present in the world that we live in. I chose that. It's not like somebody held a gun to my head and said, you're going to go do this, I chose to do it. And I chose to do it because I saw that there was a need for it in my community. That's... You continue to do it. Here's the thing, I've got the most important person on my side that I need that's going to take care of me in this life. And that's God. And if, if something happens to me in the process, there are people that will stand up and support me because they've already shown who they are. And if, if you, you can't, one of my favorite quotes personally is, God made some angels to sing like angels and he made some angels to fight. And I, I can do both. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, like, you, so, I think you put yourself into those positions and you have to be ready to accept whatever. Nobody knows what's coming on that front line of battle. When you sign up to fight a war, you don't know what's going to be on that other side. You're choosing to fight for the freedoms and the sacrifices that you're making to make sure it's better for other people behind you and other people at home. It's the same thing. It's just not, maybe the war's not the same, yep. but the soldier's the same. And you're doing it for sometimes the same reasons. So 
it's hard, but I've, I've always been one of those girls and guys in my life that you fall off the horse and you get back up and you dust yourself off and you take a few moments to collect yourself and you find the support in your life and you find where your strengths are and maybe what you need to go back and regroup on and you fight. That's what you gotta do. And luckily you have some, some legal clout behind you. Uh, but well, you know, this has been fantastic. And I hope once, you know, what are the next steps for you all? What's going on? You're looking for someone to help you. Um, you know, what do you see as the timeline going forward? So, I mean, I'd, I'd like to get a, a, an attorney on board in the next month or so. Um, we've got interest, but we've got to reach out to the ACLU and a couple other organizations in Alabama to see um, who's willing to do this with us. Obviously, it's pro bono work and not everyone has time for it. But um, activism for me and doing this type of work is so important that I'm going to make sure that we find someone to co-counsel with us to be able to take this case where we need to go. Fantastic. Uh, well, I hope you come back as hopefully things progress positively and we, we, we get a happy ending to the story. But I really appreciate you both being on, Julie, Irene. Thank you very much. Julie, if someone wants to get a hold of you, wants to follow your journey, what's the best way to follow that? So the best way would be to just come visit me at my home landing space of justjulie.com. Easy enough. J-U-S-T-J-U-L-E-I-G-H.com. Uh, you will find all of my social media platforms there. I do a weekly podcast called Rosé All Day, Julie's a Mess, which is not as um, deep as a law podcast, but, uh, <laughs> but we have a lot of fun. And um, you can come join me there, but that's where you can find all of my um, social media and everything that's going on in my life is homed at that justjulie.com. And then of course, there are ways that you can reach out to me through that website if you need to get in touch with me personally. Awesome. And we'll put that, if you're watching this on YouTube, the link will be below. If you're listening on podcasts, the link will be in the show notes. And Irene, tell me a little bit about if someone wants to work with you, if someone wants to come take one of your classes, how, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Absolutely. So my email is irene.pons, P-O-N-S at ucf.edu. That's the best way to get a hold of me um, and to try and work and collaborate. If you want to take classes at UCF, just shoot me an email. We can uh, talk you through it in the application process of our awesome legal studies program. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you all for both for being on True Law Stories. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. And thanks for having us. It's been a pleasure and hopefully talk to you soon. And thank you all for joining Julie, Irene, and I. I'm Ian Garlic, and this has been True Law Stories.